This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm the professor for this class, Chris Mack, and this is Lecture 14, Part 2 of our series on diffusion, in particular the diffusion of dopants in a semiconductor. Our reading is Chapter 3 of our textbook by Campbell. Last time we talked about the diffusion equation, the fundamental mathematical description of how diffusion works and what is required to solve that equation. We need one initial condition because there's one derivative with respect to time. That is, what's the concentration of the dopant everywhere in space at the beginning of the diffusion process. We need two boundary conditions for each dimension and we need to know what the diffusivity is. Today, in this lecture, we're going to make a very simplified assumption. We're going to assume that the diffusivity is a constant. It makes the solutions much, much easier. Uh, and as we'll talk about in the next lecture, the diffusivity of dopants in a, semi in a se real semiconductor are not constant. The diffusivity varies as a function of a number of things, and we'll talk about that next time. Nonetheless, assuming that it's constant allows us to make, um, to give, to create analytic solutions to the diffusion equation, which are very valuable to know and they serve as approximate answers to our problem and then we'll have to do uh, more difficult uh, numerical solutions uh, when we have a more exact description of the diffusivity. So here we're going to assume constant diffusivity and we're going to work strictly in one dimension. So we'll talk about a uh, blank wafer and uh, diffusing down into the silicon substrate. So Z will be our variable down into the wafer, z equals zero at the top of the wafer, and because the diffusivity is constant, we can pull it out, and we get a second derivative of, of concentration with respect to distance. So, we're going to solve this equation for three different cases. These cases will have different initial conditions and different boundary conditions. Our first case is called the constant source diffusion case. Here, our initial conditions and boundary conditions uh, are shown. The most important one is, is the boundary condition at the top. This says the concentration at the top at all times is a constant. That's why we call it the constant source. So uh, z equals zero, t is whatever the time is, and all that time we get a constant source of uh, a constant concentration of the dopant material. This is equivalent to that old style diffusion we talked about last time where we deposit dopant on the top of the wafer in a concentration in excess of the solid solubility limit so that the concentration at the top of the wafer is always at the solid solubility limit. It's always a constant value. There's a sufficient supply of dopant that we never run out and therefore this, uh, the concentration stays constant at the top. Now our initial condition is that everywhere except at the top, that is for all z's except for zero, then at the t equals zero, the beginning of our diffusion cycle, we have no dopant. So we pile up a bunch of dopant on the top of the wafer and inside the wafer there is no dopant. And then the last boundary condition at z equals zero was one boundary condition, z equals infinity is the other boundary condition, and it's a simple one. We simply say you go an infinity uh, distance down into the wafer and you're not going to find any dopant for all time. Given those three uh, initial and bound those three conditions, two boundary conditions, one initial condition, we can solve the diffusion equation in one dimension. And the solution, it's an error function. So concentration of the dopant as a function of z and t uh, for t bigger than zero and for z bigger than zero is this uh, equation cs is this uh, top constant uh, diffu uh, dopant concentration and then we have this error function erfc is called the complementary error function it's a function of, of z over two times the square root of dt i'll talk about the properties of the complementary error function on the next slide, but first let's talk about the square root of dt. That is a very special term. 
we give it the name diffusion length. And the diffusion length is, by definition, the average distance a dopant atom moves in that cycle. Uh, a couple of things. One is z scales with diffusion length. So every time you see a z in this equation, you see it divided by the square root of dt. So it's the scale uh, that, that defines the z axis. Um, also, this diffusion length goes as the square root of t, square root of time. So we get faster motion of these particles early on, and then slower motion as uh, time progresses, as the square root of t. Um, what, is that, what does that really mean? Well, we have the steepest concentration gradient at the very beginning, and then as we go on, the concentration gradient uh, decreases, and therefore the uh, rate at which diffusion occurs decreases. Well, let's look at what this error function, complementary error function, is all about. The complementary error function is shown here as a function of some argument theta. It's defined by this integral. The integral from theta to infinity of e to the minus y squared dy multiplied by 2 over pi. What is that exactly? That's really the integral of a Gaussian. So basically, if you ever have a Gaussian and you have to integrate it over the argument of that Gaussian, then you get an error function, complementary error function. Error function or complementary error function, which is it? Well, the two are very related. They're very easily related to each other. Here's the complementary error function. It's simply 1 minus the error function. That's why we say it's complementary. It's the complement of the error function. So whether you have the error function or the complementary error function, it's easy to get the other one uh, just by doing this 1 minus operation. Let's look at a graph of the complementary error function. It, it has kind of a um, S-shaped curve to it. Uh, starts at 2 and ends at um, 0. Our interest is only from the right-hand side of this curve, though. The wafer starts at z equals 0, and so this is into the wafer. So the shape of the concentration profile will look like this. Um, if you look in Appendix 5 of Campbell, you can find a lot of properties of the error function and a table of values, etc. You know, we used to tabulate these kinds of functions because we couldn't compute them very easily. And even today, most people don't have a calculator that has an error function button on it, where you can just plug in the argument, hit a button, and get your answer, like we can with sines or cosines. At the same time, it's not that hard to get the error function either, because many uh, scientific and engineering software packages have the error function built into it. Most programming languages will have the error function built into it. Um, Excel, for example, popular software for doing computations. I generated this graph in Excel, for example. It has the error function and the complementary error function built in to the software, MATLAB, etc. So uh, while not quite as easy as a sine or a cosine to do computations, it's still not that hard given, given uh, the ubiquity, ubiquitous nature of uh, software like Excel. Still, it's important to understand a few of the uh, key values for the complementary error function. In particular, at an argument of 0, we get a, a value of 1. So right here at at 0, which corresponds to the top of the wafer, we have 1 for the error function. At infinity, uh, it goes to 0. Another interesting value is at 0.5, where the argument is 0.5, the error function is dropped down to oh, about 0.5. This is valuable to know. Uh, let's look back at our solution, the concentration of the dopant as a function of z and t. Uh, it looks like this. If I check these values, when z equals 0, this whole argument goes to, this whole uh, error function goes to 1, and we have the concentration at the top equals c sub s. So that's exactly what our boundary condition demands. Likewise, at z equal to infinity, we also get uh, uh, an analytic solution to our, a simple number rather, for our complementary error function. This goes to 0, and we reach the other boundary condition that concentration at infinity equals 0. Now, 
at 0.5, that corresponds to z equals the diffusion length. Diffusion length was the square root of dt. So when z equals the square root of dt, uh, we have the complementary error function of 1 half, and its value is about 0.48. Uh, so roughly speaking, when you're one diffusion length into the wafer, the concentration of dopant has dropped by a factor of two. Out here at kind of long distances, uh, this region, uh, the complementary air function starts behaving a lot like the tail of a Gaussian. So, here's, this is our solution for the case of a constant source. Another important quantity worth noting is the dose. The total dose is the total number of dopants per unit area. We find that by simply integrating our concentration profile as a function of z over all z. Uh, so uh, we can do that for any known solution to our diffusion equation. For the case of the constant source, we plug in the complementary error function, we do the integration, and this is our result. We see that the total dose is this uh, boundary condition dose right at the top. We have C sub s as a concentration times 2 over pi multiplied by the diffusion length. In other words, the amount of dopant that is actually making it into the wafer grows in linear proportion to the diffusion length. Uh, at the very beginning of diffusion, there's no dopant inside the wafer. Uh, as we increase the, the diffusion time, the total dose, the total number of dopant atoms, uh, go, increases as the square root of time. Let's look at another important case, uh, in fact, maybe a more important case, the limited source. Uh, previously, we said uh, we have an infinite supply of dopant so that the concentration at the top of the wafer stays constant. Here, we're going to do a different set of initial and boundary conditions. Um, instead of saying that the concentration stays constant, we're going to say that the dose stays constant. So here's our dose definition right here. Uh, and we're going to say this dose is a constant. In other words, we're going to pile up at the top of the wafer a specific number of dopant atoms. Everywhere else, so all other z's other than the top, uh, the concentration is 0. There'll be a no flux condition at the top. In other words, once I've supplied a certain number of dopant atoms to the top of the wafer, I'm not going to add or lose any dopants over time. Uh, unlike the constant source case, I'm constantly adding more dopant to the wafer. Over time here, I'm adding no more. So there's no extra dopants being added or removed. And as we saw before, at z equals infinity, the concentration will remain zero. So this limited source means I've piled up a bunch of dopant right at the top, now I'm going to drive in that dopant in a diffusion step. So this is often called a drive-in diffusion. A limited quantity of dopants diffuses into the wafer. The solution to our uh, diffusion equation is a Gaussian. So C is a function of Z and T. Uh, will look like uh, this Gaussian, e to the minus Z squared over 4DT. The uh, diffusion length, square root of DT, will look just like the standard deviation of the Gaussian. Uh, well, almost. There's a factor of 2 in there as well. And uh, QT scales the whole, the whole factor. So we have a Gaussian solution for the case of a limited source. We have one more case we want to look at, look at the buried Gaussian source. So in the last case, we talked about a, a constant dose where all of the dopant atoms were piled up right along the top, and then we drive it in with a diffusion step. Here we're going to look also at a constant dose, but instead of all the dopants piled up at the top at the very beginning, we're going to have the dopants spread out as a Gaussian inside the wafer at the very beginning. So our initial time, t equals 0, our initial condition, will be this Gaussian function. The Gaussian will be centered at some distance mu down into the wafer, and we'll have some spread. 
Uh, this might happen, for example, with a certain ion implantation process where we implant the wafers where the bulk of the uh, dopants are buried down into the wafer and spread out in a Gaussian way. We'll assume that the mean position of the Gaussian is much bigger than the standard deviation so that the entire Gaussian is contained inside this wafer and it has some total dose QT. There's no flux at the top, no dopants being added or taken away uh, once we begin the diffusion step. And as before, an infinite distance away, there's no dopant for all time. So what's our solution for the case of uh, our initial condition being a Gaussian distribution of dopants? Our solution will also be a Gaussian. When you take a Gaussian and you diffuse it, you get a new Gaussian that is simply more spread out. Same dose, same QT as we had before, but we have a new variance, a new standard deviation uh, of, of the spread of the Gaussian. The new standard deviation, or the new variance rather, sigma squared, is the old variance. This is the initial condition variance up here. The old variance plus the diffusion length squared. Now, in this case, the square root of 2 times dt is the diffusion length because uh, the diffusion occurs in both directions, plus and minus, about the middle. Uh, so uh, it's slightly different form than the square root of dt, but the same basic uh, uh, result, only a square root of 2 off or different. But the important factor is that the, the new variance is the old variance plus the diffusion length squared. Also, uh, a very simple solution. If I have a Gaussian to begin with, I have a new Gaussian. The only thing that I've changed about this Gaussian is how spread out it is. Uh, when are these solutions useful? Well, case one, the constant source, is the kind of diffusion that we have in that classic old style diffusion we talked about before. When we do the diffusion in a furnace, we add dopant in that furnace so that it piles up on top of the wafer at a concentration that's greater than the solid solubility limit. We have an infinite supply of dopant, so the concentration at the top of the wafer stays constant the whole time. That's the constant source. And then it diffuses in. For case two, the limited source, we have, uh, this is a very important case, the drive-in diffusion case, where all of the dopant is piled up at the top. This happens, for example, in certain types of ion implantation pro processes where the depth over which we can put the dopant in our implant is very, very narrow, and then we let it drive in. Essentially, if the depth in which we initially place the dopant is much smaller than the diffusion length, then we can apply the limited source solution to figure out what our dopant distribution is. And the answer, of course, is a Gaussian. And in case three, the buried Gaussian, we might do an ion implantation process where we implant a Gaussian distribution of dopants inside the wafer, and then we do a diffusion and that Gaussian simply spreads out. So case two and case three are actually the more useful cases for uh, modern semiconductor manufacturing. All of these cases, however, made a very important assumption, constant diffusivity. Um, we have to be very careful when making that uh, assumption. It may not be very accurate. So what have we learned so far? You should be answer, able to answer these questions readily. What are the cases where we have derived simple analytic solutions to the diffusion equation? What assumptions did we have to make in order to derive these solutions? When might these solutions be useful? That is our uh, lecture today. Next time, we're going to look at what happens when the diffusivity is not a constant. And uh, things get complicated, to say the least.